the continued global growth, plateauing global growth, but accompanied by tightening, late cycle tightening. This is you know normal environment for this point in the economic cycle. They told us if it was for a good reason, Leesman, that it, well, it, it wouldn't matter, and that, that's, that's being borne out. That's right, and it's a race, right? It's a race between the growth that you get, which helps the bottom line of the companies who borrow, who have to pay higher interest rates. That's the circle we're in, and that's why you, know, you can wake up one morning in a sweat over the huge amount of corporate debt that's out there, and you can kind of roll over and say, oh, the economy is growing, and therefore their coverage ratios, so I don't know which one to believe. We have a fixed income expert. An expert. That's we leave him. James Camp. Uh, do you have just uh, something to respond to now or you want to start a whole new... Uh, well, no, I like the comment because Steve touches on something very important. Does the globe continue quantitative tightening with crisis that may emerge? I mean, for the first time in the U.S., we had a downdraft in equities to start the year and the Fed stood down. Heretofore, to Becky's point, over the last 10 years, uh, if the markets caught a cold, the Fed stood down. And this time, we do seem to be normalizing based on data dependency, at least U.S. My question for the Eurozone and others, when Italian 10-year debt is 3.4% and German bonds are 25 basis points, how right. long are they going to allow that disparity to go on? Right. And so I think I can't we, believe it's continued. central it's banks have to be tested in a crisis and continue the course for me to believe QT is really, is really here. Do you think global growth may have peaked? We can't, does it not here, you mean global, I and mean, we can't, we can't uh, spark the entire globe to renewed uh, growth? No, I think you have a fundamental problem in Europe, which is probably a broader conversation, but the, uh, the banking system in Italy, Spain, and others is showing uh, the strains. When you see these yield disparities between sovereign debt within the Eurozone, it tells you something. At the same time, when we look at U.S. interest rates, it's impossible for me to posit a scenario where the 10-year goes to Jamie Dimon's 5% when German bonds are 25 basis points. It doesn't work. The math it, doesn't it's work. It's possible, I think, for the, um, if we put the map back up, the U.S. could go blue before Europe and Japan go we red. Should. I mean, oh, we would they be go done. before they go yeah. red. We would yeah. be done either, I don't know, what, I guess neutral would be white. But on that map, you're, wouldn't you're that be cool? You're talking about the election. You're finally telling people what you really want. So, <laughs> uh, I stepped into go. that. Yeah. I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let that just sit there because I deserve that. I meant in terms of global easing. That's not easing. what you meant. That's not what I meant, but, but it is possible Jim, for... Should I worry about... <laughs> the dollar's already strong, and, and we're already in a, in a trade war. I mean, we want to export, and it's going to get stronger if we keep raising yields, and that, that could hurt our contribution to global growth. Yeah, like I said, we're going to have to have some synchronization in central bank policy, and right now we don't have it. It's still... Uh, the global yield environment is still largely negative. It's not 33% negative. It's about down to 12, 14% negative. But there's still massive accommodations going on globally. And the, I think the U.S. problem is going to come up against yeah. its own yield curve, right? We've got uh, two more Fed hikes this year. I think that's baked in the cake. You've got a yield curve that's going to flat to potentially invert. And I think back to Steve's point, how does corporate indebtedness that has been modified and corporate behavior been modified with these low rates, how, how does it handle LIBOR going to 2.73%? It's going to be very challenging. How, how will the market, if, if Steve's blue wave does happen in November, <laughs> how will the hope for a blue wave, how will that... Uh, Wait, which blue wave? The political yeah, the, blue wave or the easing blue wave? What were you talking wave? about? I was talking about the easing thing. The, the blue was easing oh, in the uh, yeah. index. Maybe I should go yellow and brown or something to avoid any confusion in the future. Well, you did have nope. Elizabeth Warren right, know, just ahead with, of uh, Jim Cramer. certainly did. Yeah, I mean, uh, the market, look, the market is expecting right now what's, what appears to be priced in is uh, the Democrats taking House, the House, but right, Senate, Senate right. staying Republican. And, um, you know, that's, a, that's kind of normal kind of gridlock. And, and we've seen that in a variety of environments. And the U.S. economy tends to do fine. Will there be some headlines that will cre create some additional volatility? Sure. But at this point in the cycle, we expect volatility, VIX, to be in the 15 to 20 range. We're back there right now at 16, but you know that's that's normal at this point in the cycle. So, that yes, that's an overhang. But unless you see both houses go democratic, I think that's you know pretty fully priced into them. You know, Eric, there's one other point that we haven't brought into this discussion about the growth plateau that's critical, and that is immigration. So, yeah. if you look back at the demography of the United States and the long-term growth that we experience up to the financial crisis, mm -hmm. the country's expansionary immigration policy was a critical contributor to that whole process. And if if immigration stalls for a variety of reasons, the, the effect, the deleterious effect that has on demand can lead to slowing that is uh, really unnecessary. In many well, respects. and if that flows into um, uh, labor, labor costs and inflation, right. which, we, which we haven't seen yet, which is very interesting. You know, new labor has been coming back into the market. Productivity has actually been ticking up. Unit labor costs have not been going up as much as, as uh, 
um, as hourly earnings, and even those are all within a, a moderate band. Which, back to James's point, gives the you know the Fed can the Fed can raise two times more and still just be at their neutral rate. So they haven't even hit their neutral rate yet. Our, our view is they raise twice more, probably September, maybe December, maybe early in the new year, but then they pause. They don't have to keep they don't have to keep raising. They'll be at their neutral rate. And frankly, if if the dollar keeps strengthening, if there appears to be more stress, you know that that's going on, Turkey leads to you know, domino number one or two, which isn't our forecast, but it could that, be that's really the question. I know we got to go to break, pause, but yeah. but but can we do this process without having a big blow up? And and if it's individual or idiosyncratic or unique to a single country, that's not a problem. The problem is when you get into contagion. And the, the idea that we could have done all this easing and get out of it without a major blow up, I think, is was probably the low percentile but it, it, bet. It's already kind of wreaking havoc in the emerging markets. Right, right. Like, it's not, it, though. It, it, I mean, who, who knows, right? It may, it may, and it, it may end up, but it's not. A cataclysm. Yeah, no, it's not. No, it's it not a contagion. It's not you mean, like it hasn't spread to everybody right, else. Right. I'm glad I didn't that. buy the Argentinian hundred year right. two years yeah. ago. Yeah. Let's put it that <laughs> way. But, but, but the the, the, me, the measure of it all is when the healthy get sick, and the healthy so right. far are not. And, and what Ben Steele's comment showed you there earlier is that it's the ones who had the bad fiscal. Mm -hmm. Economic Darwinism. Uh, right. Exactly. <laughs> That's right. That's this is the moment. Well, and it's it's central banks that are raising from a position of strength. So right. the U.S., the U.K. And capital and deployment is changing, to the professor's point. Capital deployment is changing. Productivity is increasing because we're not rewarding buybacks exclusively. Uh, companies okay. that did CapEx in Q1 and 2 outperformed the S&P by 200 basis points. That's the beauty of That's exiting a good, QE. That's a cool point because for we now day. have corporate CEOs right. and CFOs saying highest uh, best use of capital is not buying back shares. It's doing what we're supposed to do with capitalism. Yep. We don't need Elizabeth Warren to help us get there. Capitalism mm -hmm. will do it if we get the Fed out of the way.